Welcome everyone. I am Michelle Pacansky Brock. I am faculty mentor for online teaching and learning. I work for the California Community Colleges for CVC and At One, and we are a statewide initiative funded by our chancellor's office to provide access to increase access to high quality online education for our students. Um, and this is one session in a broader series about humanized online teaching and learning called Fall into Humanized Online Teaching. And our focus is on equity. We're thinking about humanizing offers us a pathway to educational equity. Today's session is titled Being a Warm Demander, Challenging Students with Relationship-Rich Teaching and Wise Feedback. And our agenda for today, we're gonna to get started with a warm up like we have in previous sessions about memorable educators. And then we'll move on to the lean in section of the, the workshop today, which is the presentation on being a warm demander. You're also gonna learn about wise feedback and growth mindset as well. Um, and then for the engage portion, you'll be doing some practice. Uh, it'll be a quiet work time this time. You won't be using a particular technology or tool or building something. We're working on our teaching practice today, working on humanizing our feedback. Um, so you'll be applying what you learn from the lean in section, section today. And then as always for the last section of our time together, we'll open it up for discussion and um, and I look forward to that part always. So for our warm up today, I would like you to take a moment to reflect on your life and think about all the teachers, all the educators you had. And I want you to pick one memorable educator. I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that. And as you settle on one memorable educator, the next thing I want you to do is to write down two words that describe that person. You can jot that down on a piece of paper, on your phone, any, anything available to you right now. And now that you have those two words, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a Mentimeter activity. This is um, Maze, oops, Maze used, Maze IMAD used this last time, so I thought we'd extend it. Um, Helen, do you have the link for that that you can put in the chat? Thank you so much. You can either click on that link, or if you do have a phone nearby, you can scan that QR code that you see on the screen and it'll open instantly on your phone. And we want you to take those two words and actually put them into the Mentimeter activity. Okay, so if you put them in the chat, um, cool. I want you to also put the two words into the Mentimeter activity. So go to the link that Helen put in the chat and Helen uh, just did it again. Thank you. Or scan that. QR code on the screen. I'm going to give you um, a little bit of time to do this. You'll be prompted to enter one word and then the next word. I'm going to go take a look at our results with you. and see what's come out here. So the words that appear bigger are words that have been listed more frequently. That's how word clouds work. So I'm gonna read some of those words that, that I can read because I can't read the small ones. We see the word caring and kind seem to be pretty consistent even as more words are coming in. Encouraging and passionate, supportive, those are our big winners. 
I'll let that just kind of evolve for a couple more seconds here. I want you to reflect on your memories of those educators and on these words. And I want you to also be thinking about the kind of educator you want to be for your students and how you want to be remembered in the future as your students leave your class and continue on with their lives. Um, and I also want us to think about some of the some of the, I'm gonna use the word stereotypes out there about professors um, that I think can really kind of play with the kind of professor that we wanna be. And there are these social constructions out there about what it means to be a professor that come out through the movies, um, that come out in different ways. Jessamine Newhouse does work on this and she talks about it as the super teacher myth. She talks about that, 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 that super teacher professor as this person who is almost always male, almost always white, and has this um, almost always um, cisgender, almost always able-bodied, I could keep going and going and going on that, but has this also mystical way of just kind of having learning happen through osmosis, right? The professor has so much charisma and just has to kind of stand up there and speak and everybody learns. And that's something that kind of, I keep saying plays with us. And I, I think it's something that we have to be aware of and be conscious of and deconstruct and really try to stay true to the kind of educator that, that, that we want to be. And by reflecting on our past experiences, sometimes that's a really good way to kind of anchor us in reality. So <clears throat> with that said, we want to get those stereotypes out of our mind and focus on, on what we know is, is important in teaching. Um, and I want to take that warm up. I want you to take those memories and really keep them at the heart of what we're doing here today. Um, that was not scripted. I didn't know what words were going to come up, but I could have put money on it because those are the words that always come up, folks. And research shows that relationships, human connections are what matters in college. And there's a lot of research around this. There's a new book that recently came out called Relationship Rich Teaching. Um, and it's nothing earth shattering, but again, the finding is, is that relationships are not only important to everyone, but they're more important to first generation students and uh, low income students. I wanna start this presentation this morning by acknowledging the work of Sarah Goldrick Rabb and Jesse Stommel, who I learn a lot from, who I continue to learn a lot from, who are very vocal, very public in about talking about their own teaching and writing about their own teaching philosophies. Um, and together they have written this. They say, we need to design our pedagogical approaches for the students we have, not the students we wish we had. This requires approaches that are responsive, inclusive, adaptive, challenging, and compassionate. This is not a theoretical exercise, it's a practical one. And this statement to me captures the essence of a systemic problem that we have in higher education that needs to be front and center in our professional development, our faculty development, our training, whatever word it is that we describe what we're doing right now about teaching and learning, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. We are not here to change who our students are. We are here to support the students that we have. We know that COVID has threatened the college goals of students. And we also know that more students of color and low income students and first gen students have left college since 2020. I really see this as a moment for us to reset ourselves. And I know that you're thinking how much more can we reset, but maybe it's a reset of how we think about our students that we need right now. Um, and I'm generalizing and I acknowledge that all of you have chosen to be here today because you are committed to this. So I may be preaching to those who don't really need to hear this, but um, I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm hoping more people will watch this recording. <laughs> so we want to really dig deep and imagine the role that we want to play in our students' lives. Imagine the opportunity we have to be remembered as that person 
that person who gave me a boost, that person who gave me a chance, that person who enabled me to be who I could be, who I knew I could be. That could be you. Every day we have that opportunity. And that's an amazing opportunity. And as we think about that quote um, by Jesse Stommel and Sarah Goldrick Rabb, we need to consider in the context of the knowledge that we have about the students um, that we serve. And a survey conducted by the Hope Center, which is uh, where Sarah, Sarah leads the Hope Center, um, in 2019, a study of 40,000 California community college students conducted by the Hope Center found that seven out of 10 students, seven out of 10 students experienced both food and housing insecurity or homelessness in the past year. And 52%, which is one out of every two students, said they either couldn't afford to eat balanced meals or worried what their their food would worried that their food would run out before they had money to buy more. The instability of our students' basic needs is not a result of COVID. Yes, COVID has heightened it. It's made it worse, but it's not a new situation. It's not a new problem. And the students who are most likely to experience basic needs threats are listed here on this slide. Our transgender, bisexual, lesbian, and gay students, African American or Black, American Indian, Alaskan Native, our students who are older over age 21, have been in foster care, served in the military, formerly incarcerated, have ADHD. And I want to acknowledge that identities intersect. So it's very likely for students to identify with more than one bullet on the screen here, which is increases their basic needs threats even more. And we know from past sessions that we've had together that those threats to basic needs affect the way people learn, right? Because when our needs, when our safety is threatened, we aren't capable, humans aren't capable of moving into cognition and learning. It disrupts that emotional state that is the ground floor of learning. So when we're presented with opportunities to engage in professional development, faculty development, training, certification, and I know you've all had plenty of these opportunities lately, all of these things need to be set within the context of who the students are that we're serving. And when we think about things like course design, educational technologies, picking those technologies, assessment, how we assess our students, how we grade our students, and things like online proctoring, which is an educational technology, they too need to crit be critically examined and looked at through the lenses of the students we serve. That's part of equity. We know students who feel valued and respected for the authentic, their authentic selves are students that stick around. Humans want to stay where they, where they belong. Students who feel like they need to change who they are to fit in are students who won't stick around. Not belonging is a stressful, painful, and toxic experience for a human. We've considered these ideas now for many weeks of part of the series, and we're stressing that belonging can be fostered in online classes, and that's our goal. We've been looking at our courses as an unfolding experience over time and thought mindfully about how online learning has the potential to strip out the human connections that are so vital to serving our students. So our goal is to intentionally build those connections. We've discussed the first two weeks of an online class as a high opportunity zone. And we focused on creating a liquid syllabus, a humanized course card, a humanized homepage, and a getting to know you survey. And today we're shifting gears a little bit to focus less on creating something tangible that you can put in your class and focusing more on the art of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. These are words that get used a lot. And so I wanna spend just a moment to unpack them a little bit. Um, they're often used interchangeably, but there are difference between them. And if we look at the work of Gloria Ladson-Billings and Geneva Gay, scholars, amazing teachers, 
Here's what we learn from their work. Culturally relevant teaching recognizes a student's past, present, and future as the context of their learning. It focuses on what improves the lives of the students, their families, and the communities that we serve. Culturally responsive teaching uses the cultural knowledge, prior experiences, and frames of reference and performance styles of ethnically diverse students to make learning more relevant and effective for them. It is validating, multidimensional, empowering, transformative, and emancipatory. To look at it from another angle, culturally relevant teaching is more about how you think about your students and culturally responsive teach teaching is more about what you do with your students. And both of these are critical. Both of these are critical um, mindsets, I should say skills to bring into, to foster in our teaching and ourselves as teachers. So being culturally relevant means being intentionally mindful of our students' past experiences, right? Knowing them as real people, and we focused on our getting to know you survey last week, and understanding where they're headed in life. And often there's a big disconnect between the reality of college professors' past educational experiences and the past realities of our students in education. And I include myself in this statement. This is very true for me. My socioeconomic status and the color of my skin and other privileges have granted me privileges that have seeped into my classroom experiences as a kindergartner, a first grader, a second grader, et cetera. And I never recognized this until quite, until quite recently. This quote from Zaretta Hammond's book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, a book I highly recommend, says, classroom studies document the fact that underserved English learners, poor students, and students of color routinely receive less instruction and higher order skills development than any other students. This denies students the opportunity to engage in what neuroscientists call productive struggle that actually grows our brain power. As a result, a disproportionate number of culturally and linguistically diverse students are dependent learners. Now I emphasize the words productive struggle and dependent learners here because they're especially important for our workshop topic today. All of us have dependent and independent learners in our class. We need to know this and carry this with us into our teaching. Every human begins as a dependent learner and it's through productive cognitive struggle that a person develops into an independent learner. And students who are poor, English learners and or people of color are less likely to have had the privilege to be challenged in their educational experiences through productive struggle. And this isn't a result of systemic racism in our country. This is part of unconscious, unconscious bias. That means they're more likely to be dependent learners. What you see here is a continuum with dependent learner on one end and independent learner on the other end. Some characteristics we're likely to see in dependent learners are uncertainty about how to tackle a new task, they need scaffolding to complete tasks and will sit passively and wait if stuck until the teacher intervenes. On the independent learner end, we see very different characteristics. Independent learners possess cognitive strategies for getting unstuck. They can attempt new tasks without the need for scaffolds. And they've learned how to retrieve information from their long-term memory. That is a skill, that is a skill that has to be practiced to be able to master it. All of these are. Now, warm demand or pedagogy is a culturally responsive teaching approach that thought, creates opportunities for students to engage in productive struggle through engaging in challenging tasks. It helps the student develop from a dependent into an independent learner. And warm demand or pedagogy is challenging for students, but it doesn't start with challenge. It starts with care. 
It's through the blend of care and challenge or care and push that warm demand or pedagogy works. It starts with unhinging the distrust that many of our students, particularly our black students and other students of color bring with them into college. As Luke Wood explains, black people, particularly black males grow up in the United States in a shadow of distrust, disdain and disregard. And we have the opportunity to dismantle that through a relationship anchored in validation and care. The quote here from Drs. Wood and Harris says, students who often feel invisible and unimportant, they need to be seen and valued by educators. We focused a lot on building trust, right? In previous sessions together, trust is our foundation. It's the foundation of culturally responsive pedagogy. It can't just be washed over. We can't just say it and move on. We have to really think about what that means. And we've been doing that for weeks now. It has to be in place before we move on. It's the foundation that gives us the opportunity as teachers to, hold, to build relationships with our students and hold them to high standards. Once a person knows you care about them and that you believe in their abilities, they are more likely to lean in and challenge themselves, push themselves to do things that maybe initially they weren't sure they were capable of. That is how we create an environment for students, all students to flourish and reach their full intellectual potential. In a 1975 study, Judith Kleinfeld found two characteristics that distinguished effective teachers from ineffective teachers of indigenous students. She did this work in Alaska, and this is her work on um, that, that led to the term warm demander. And uh, those, these two competencies are the ability to create a climate of emotional worth, warmth that dissipates students' fears and fulfills their expectations of highly personalized relationships. And two, the ability to express concern for students, not passive sympathy, but by, de but by demanding a high quality of, I thought I read that wrong, <laughs> of academic work, sorry folks. Yeah, so these two things to keep in mind, again, starting with trust, and really breaking up that, that, those angst, those fears, those, those threats that we've been talking about for, for weeks now, um, and really demanding high quality work. A couple of other characteristics of warm demand or pedagogy from the work of Kleinfeld expresses personal warmth versus impersonal professionalism. Think about that. When we are professional, we are not exuding personal warmth. We can be professional and warm and caring and kind at the same time. We can do that. Shows personal regard for students, prioritizes building rapport and trust, earns the right to demand engagement and effort, clearly communicates high standards and scaffolds learning, encourages and celebrates productive struggle. Maybe those are some things that are resonating with you. Maybe those are some things that you've always known, but you've never felt validated enough to really bring into the center of your teaching. I want you to know that, and I want you to feel validated. Start with trust. Then we bring in the relationship, and then we bring in the challenge, okay? We're gonna do um, a check-in here. I have actually a poll for you, a little check-in that I'm gonna launch. And I just have a couple of questions I want you to respond to. Should be seeing two questions on your screen now. I invite you to answer them.
Still see those numbers going up? I can see them, the response is coming in. So when it starts slowing down, I'll let you know. Okay. We are now slowing down. And give you about 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. So let's take a look at those. Which, war, which of the following is not a characteristic of a warm demander? The correct answer there is impersonal professionalism. Okay. Yes, the other ones are characteristics of a warm demander. Warm demander pedagogy intentionally engages students in cognitive struggle is the correct answer. Um, actually, a warm demander is more likely to take high stakes assessments and break them into smaller formative assessments and use scaffolding throughout learning to ensure that students have opportunities to see and track their development of their learning over time. Um, and while quiet reflection is probably a good part of it, it's not one of the things that emerges in the research. I wanna also acknowledge a, a little bit of skepticism that I saw in the chat about the, my reference to a 1975 study. I assure you that if you look up this work, you will see a trajectory of this original work used in education primarily in K through 12, which I find very compelling. And I've seen some comments in the chat. I'm not sure if they're direct to me or not about that though. Um, it's interesting how in higher education, there's kind of the, when, this notion that when a person turns 18, they're, they move from, be, they move into being an adult learner and then there's all this stuff about learning we shouldn't tend to anymore. It's not the way it happens. It's not the way it works. And, and there's so much variety in terms of who we are serving. It's true for some people. And that's the type of learner that higher education has served. And when we look at our equity gaps, that's why those equity gaps exist. So let's be very critical about that. And, um, and I encourage everybody to take a look at the research and dig in deeper. So now we're going to talk a little bit about wise feedback. We're going to keep moving forward. Um, and we, again, you've seen this enough times. I like to reiterate it because I think it's, it's helpful to reiterate ideas. We are now going to build on top of this and add on ability and action. Okay, so building onto these foundational elements of cultural responsive teaching, we're going to look now at wise feedback as a strategy to roll into our teaching, um, into our equitable equitable uh, teaching. This can be done online or in the classroom. It's not contingent upon a delivery mode. Wise feedback is a research-based practice for delivering critical feedback in a way that fosters trust, increases student engagement, and reduces performance gaps between white and black students. Who was here for the Claude Steele session back in early September? Say yes if you were here for that in the chat. Yeah, okay, so a lot of people were, I'm sure a lot of people weren't and that's okay, but I'm glad to know a lot of people were, excellent. So you, Dr. Steele spoke about wise feedback. He spoke about wise feedback and what he, he talked about was when feedback is, when critical feedback is given, it's received differently depending on who the student is. And there's research that shows that a student's race influences how that feedback is received. It's, it's a big influencer. So research shows that a white student is more likely to receive critical feedback from a professor and take it as a challenge. Now, when we look at the research about how that same feedback affects a black student, it's much different. And it evokes threat, it evokes stereotype threat. It evokes the fear, the anxiety that the professor is delivering that negative feedback or that critical feedback because of perceptions the professor holds about the student's ability. 
So those negative stereotypes about ability are then in the air, right? That's our stereotype threat. So a way around that, what the research has found, and it's really phenomenal, um, is there's three components of wise feedback. In the feedback, you wanna reference three things. First of all, anchor the feedback in high standards. And just by doing that, it deflects that fear in the student from thinking that it is a reflection of the professor's response to their identity, right? It kind of, it deflects that stereotype threat. High standards are critical. The next thing is in the feedback, assure students of your belief in their ability to achieve the objective. That validates their self-efficacy. And then the third thing is to include specific actionable steps for your student to effectively make these improvements. And that's really important because if we just do the first two, students are gonna know that they've done something wrong but they're not gonna, they may not know how to get out of that cycle. They may just keep con, con, in this continuous loop of doing the wrong thing. And so that, those are the three components of wise feedback that research shows reduces racial equity gaps. So let's take a look at what those might look like. High standards might look like something like this. This is a challenging skill for many students, just a phrase like that. This part of the course is particularly difficult and mastering it is important for your future growth in this discipline. What does an ability statement look like? I'm confident you can do this. Look back at how much you've learned already. You have been improving your scores over the past few modules. You've got this. Actionable, what does that look like? To move forward, I want you to focus on and be specific about what those things are or that one thing is. To complete this assignment successfully, go back and take a look at the resource in module two, right? Reminding students that there are resources out there, hopefully that you've already provided, that are there to help support them. That's what wise feedback looks like. So now we're gonna do a WISE feedback check-in. And we've got one question here. Which of the following is true of WISE feedback? Okay, five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. Almost everyone got this one right, good for you. Um, so it diffuses the perception that negative feedback may, related to, may be related to a student's identity. Yes, it does that. It has been shown to reduce racial equity gaps. Yes, it does that. It has been shown to do that. It is an equitable way to deliver critical feedback. Yes, it is that. And it's comprised of high standards, ability, and actionable steps. Yes, that is correct. So the correct answer for that one is um, all of the above. Um, let's see here. I'm going to take a look in the Q&A. I just have a comment here from 
Eliana that says another study that uses asset pedagogy and supports what Kleinfeld said about warm demand or pedagogy is the one by Ladson and Billings in 1995, just to support what you said about warm demand or pedagogy. Yes, so the warm demand or ped pedagogy gets it, it gets blended into everything. And in fact, I would say that you can even see it in the wise feedback, right? There's a lot of crossover there too. So thank you for sharing that, Eliana. Um, and uh, Neela, you have asked a, a great question and I honestly, I don't have the answer to this. What does the research show about Brown and black instructors, critical feedback and student perception? I don't know if there is research on that. Um, this is this is not an area that higher education has done well in terms of the research. Um, so I, I encourage others to, to, to look into that, but I don't have that answer for you right now. Oops, I did that wrong, hold on. Okay, so let's go ahead and move forward, folks. Now we're moving on to growth mindset. Tell me if you're familiar with this, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. It's been around a while and it's gotten really popular in educational circles. Um, but let's dig into it a little bit more because it's one of these things that I think gets used a lot, but not really unpacked really closely. And we're just spending a few minutes on it. So by no means is this really closely. Um, but again, we've got a continuum here with fixed mindset at the one end and growth mindset at the other end. And basically what research shows is that people fall somewhere on this continuum, okay? People meaning everyone, professors too. Um, fixed mindset is a, is a cultural construct and growth mindset is based on research about brain plasticity. So let's dig into fixed mindset first. It's based on the idea that ability is fixed. It's innate to who you are as a person and it can't change. Okay, that's what a fixed mindset is. People with a fixed mindset, when failure is experienced, it's usually something extremely negative and it's an indication that one should just stop or give up. Critical feedback is more likely to be received as a personal attack. Fixed mindset fosters choosing easier tasks. And this makes sense if you think about it, because if there's no benefit to putting in lots of work, if it's not going to grow your intellectual ability, then why would you do it, right? So it kind of fosters that choosing the, the easy way out. And there's an emphasis on uh, measurable accomplishments. With growth mindset, ability is understood to be changeable kind of like, like a muscle, right? The more you work a muscle, the stronger it gets. So the, the, the metaphor there of the brain as a muscle works with growth mindset. It's improved through effort. Failure is a chance to learn, right? It acknowledges that you have to make mistakes in order to move forward. And it's through making a mistake that we, we learn things and we apply that and it makes us stronger. It embraces challenge, it fosters embracing challenging tasks and working hard to improve. It emphasizes continual improvement. And I really wanna stress this last one, it requires self-efficacy or one's belief that they're capable. And that's really important. And that comes out of the critique of uh, Dr. Luke Wood about um, growth mindset. And he has gotten very critical about, about the concept, not to, not to slam the concept of growth mindset, but to say, if we look at just effort and don't focus on validation and self-efficacy, then we're leaving students out because it implies that a person has that belief that they're capable. And that's not true of everyone. Oh, let me ask you something else here, folks. Which one of these do you think our educational system is more likely to foster? I'm seeing fixed. Yeah, it's really, Interesting. So I think it's really critical for us to be thinking about the systemic issues um, and more broadly about like, you know, we're going to talk about language to foster growth mindset, but what about like the way we grade our students, the way we assess our students, everything that we do in, in teaching and learning has the opportunity to foster growth mindset, right? 
by accepting late work or saying, okay, you didn't get a complete on this, but rework it and do it again and submit it again. That fosters growth mindset. Now, this is really fascinating. This is uh, research from 2019. This is emerging research. It shows that instructors with fixed mindsets have higher racial equity gaps. Faculty mindset beliefs can positively or negatively influence the achievement of minoritized students. Faculty with fixed mindsets send cues that cause minoritized students to be concerned about being judged in terms of ability stereotypes. Faculty with fixed mindsets have larger racial achievement gaps. And this, this research was done in STEM classes. It's a big problem in STEM. It's a big problem in STEM. So when we work in things like growth mindset, interprofessional development or faculty development, I want to really encourage this self-awareness and reflection of one's own mindset. I think once you understand it also, you can kind of use it in conversations with peers as well. Okay. So I want everyone to ask yourself, which mindset do you seek to foster in your students? And this is what each of these mindsets can look like in the things that we say. Fixed mindset can look like, that's okay, maybe you're just not a math person. Only half of you will pass this class. This class is graded on a curve. You'll know your grade when the class is over. No makeup exams or late work accepted. Your exams will be all multiple choice and you will be observed with an online proctoring tool to ensure you don't cheat. This is what growth mindset can look like. Everyone can learn and be successful in this course. Struggle is part of learning. Everyone will be challenged. Everyone will be challenged at some point in this course. This class is designed to support your continued learning and growth over time. In college, I struggled a lot in this class too. Here's a story for you. All assignments have rubrics to ensure you are clear about how to be successful. If you don't earn a complete on a rubric criteria, redo your assignment and resubmit it for credit. So hopefully some of that, that resonates with you. Um, we wanna encourage you to incorporate messages of growth mindset into your course materials. For those of you who are with us for the liquid syllabus session, go back to that liquid syllabus and look for cues of growth mindset. Look for cues of fixed mindset, tag them, color code them and work on improving those. I have some language here that you're welcome to borrow. It comes out of a resource. I adapted it a little bit. Um, that's linked at the bottom of the slide that is super helpful for those of you who want to dig a little bit deeper in this. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. It's very long, but I think these examples are really helpful. Okay, so let's do our growth mindset check-in. You should now be seeing a growth mindset um, poll on your screen with two questions.
Okay, 10, 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Three, two, one. And share the results. I'm glad you liked that second question, folks. Uh, which are examples of growth mindset statements? And the two statements, let's take a look here. Don't feel badly about your grades. Some people aren't cut out for chemistry. That's an example of fixed mindset, right? Because we want to encourage students that if they keep working and they know that their instructor believes in them, they're going to be able to get there. Um, the assignments in this course will help develop your knowledge over time. That is growth mindset. It sets learning in a context of growth and development. Look at how much you've learned in the past two months. You're on your way. That's another example of growth mindset. And that looking back at learning, that's an example of bringing in metacognition to our teaching. You can do that in the words that you use with your students and also just by giving them assignments to reflect on what they've learned and to write about it or record a video about it or do some way to really demonstrate, let them get creative with how they, how they tell you what it is that they've learned. But making that learning visible, again, that's not something that everybody just knows how to do. You have to develop that skill. And by bringing that into your teaching, it's a great way to bring in growth mindset also. And then lastly, if you don't do well in exams, this probably isn't the class for you. Yes, that is fixed mindset. You guys nailed that one. Um, college instructors with a fixed mindset have less hair, higher racial equity gaps in their courses, higher cholesterol, and 45% more cavities. Um, the only one that's been proven in the research that I know of is the second answer, higher racial equity gaps in their courses. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in our check-ins which are examples of formative assessments, which also help with establishing growth mindset. You can do that in Zoom too. Okay. So I did say just a moment ago that we wanna encourage you, we're not gonna take time to do this here, but it's just a, a cue to all of you to take a look at your liquid syllabus, look at it through the eyes of all the students that you serve, everything, if, if, you, if you learned something here today or in this series that you hadn't used before in thinking about your students, hopefully that helps. Identify words, phrases, and policies that foster, foster growth mindset and celebrate those. And where you see opportunities for improvement, work on those, right? That's how you take a growth mindset to your own liquid syllabus. Now we're gonna put it all together. This is what we've looked at so far. We've looked at trust as the foundation. We've looked at building on our positive instructor to student relationship on top of trust, right? So sending cues of trust, remember that marble jar, that Brene Brown metaphor, trust is like a marble jar. It, trust doesn't just get established quickly, it builds up slowly over time. So we need to be do, making these small gestures to build trust with our students. And that's, you've got many strategies about that from our earlier sessions. And then that positive instructor-student relationship has to involve getting to know who our students are, understanding what's happening on the other side of the screen, right? Just because they they're not sharing our space doesn't mean that we're not intentionally making efforts to understand the context of our class. I mean, what we do, our content should always be informed by who we're teaching. So every class we start, we need to know who is it that we're teaching. And the um, getting to know you survey that we worked on in the last session, each of you had an opportunity to import one from the Canvas Commons, tweak it, pull it into your Canvas course. That's an opportunity to build a positive instructor to student relationship. I want to share a little story. I, I teach one late start online class and uh, at, a, at a community college here in California. And I shared my getting to know you survey just this week. And I had a student yesterday, I was reading the student's responses. And at the very last question was, is there anything else you want to share with me? And I was thinking about taking that question off because I thought, ah, oh, it's kind of a long survey. I just left it in there. And the one student said, 
This is a super cool survey and it makes me really excited about having you as my instructor. And I was so grateful that I left that question in there because those things do so much for us. And I wanna acknowledge that this, getting to know our students brings us more joy. It brings us more passion for what we do. Um, and I hope that you see that too. I hope that you see that too. And I encourage you to share in the chat if you have anything that, that is resonating with you with regards to that. And then on top of that relationship, right, that's our foundation that we hold all students to, to high standards, okay? This is not about dumbing things down. It's not about being a mushy pushover, okay? We can be caring and challenging at the same time. Those two things are often seen as opposition. We can be both at the same time. And that's what I want you to really feel empowered about by the end of this session, if you didn't already feel that way. And then on top of that, through the language that we use in our materials, through the language that we use in our videos, uh, through the way that we design our course, some of the choices that we make in our policies also, and in our feedback, we want to build in ability, action, and effort. That effort was the last one that ties in with growth, growth mindset. So use this, keep this image in mind. Uh, it, enca it encapsulates the culturally responsive pedagogy that we want to encourage everybody to use in their humanized online courses on our quest for equity. A quick humanizing tip, record your feedback in video. I didn't have time to pull research about this, but there is research. Most research focuses on voice feedback. There's a little bit of research on video feedback that shows how it fosters social presence. None of it's in the context of equity though. Again, this is a space where higher education really needs to improve. And I hope to see more research in this area, but you will see, see some research about how it makes feedback less, it's received better. The feedback is received better when a student can hear the intonation in your voice instead of just read it, right? The voice really makes a big impact like that. Um, and uh, there are different tools you can use for this. And by no means do I have an exhaustive list on the screen. I've only listed a few. If you use a screencasting tool, what it will allow you to do is record your screen so you could share your student's work and then speak. So your student would be looking at their work. You know, you could be using your cursor or, or some kind of annotation to mark it up and then speaking as the student watched that video back, watches that video back. You can do that with a free tool called Screencast-O-Matic. If you go look up Screencast-O-Matic, you will find that it has a free version and then other upgraded versions that cost money. The free version is fine. Give it a try. Um, it does need to be hosted. And if you have a free Screencast-O-Matic account, you can actually host it through something that they call Quick Share, and it, it'll upload directly to your Screencast-O-Matic account. This is important. Um, the link should only go in the secure Canvas grades area so that only the student who you're sending that video to has access to it. That's very important for FERPA. And the other thing that's very important is Captioning of one-on-one -on -one video communications is necessary if a student requires it as an accommodation. So if you think back to our getting to know you survey, one of the questions we had in there was, I may leave you voice or video feedback. Does that work for you or do you prefer written feedback? So if you have an, a student who says they prefer written feedback, please lean on that and um, honor that, that request. Um, and check to see what tools your, your campus has. It, I, there's so many colleges out there and everybody has access to different tools. Ask about Canvas Studio. That's a super way, easy way to record a screencast. Um, Camtasia is a little bit more of a, a steeper curve, but it's a great product. And I'm seeing other examples pop up into, um, into the chat. So Aileen has said TechSmith Capture, formerly Jing is a good free alternative. Snagit, thank you for sharing more examples. So 
now it's time for our engage session, folks. This is where we want to give you some time to really work on your practice. We want to honor you. And so here's what we're going to do. In past sessions, we've broken up into different into different Zoom rooms and had opportunities to work with tools. This is gonna be a quiet reflection work period time. We're gonna take about 15 minutes to let you work on this. So I'm gonna walk through it with you. Um, and Helen is putting the um, instructions right there in um, the chat for you. And I see 30 people are in there already, so that's great. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. The first thing we want you to do is reflect on the following hypothetical scenario between an instructor and a student. As you read the scenario, consider how you would approach giving feedback if this was your online student. So let's read this together. Jaden is one of 45 students in your online course. For the first three weeks of the course, she's logged into Canvas regularly and has submitted all three homework assignments on time and completed the first exam. However, her current grade is 60% in the homework category and 50% in the exam category. You sent out emails to all students in the class that did not pass the first exam, which includes Jaden. The email you sent reads, hello, I'm contacting you because I am concerned about your grade on the most recent exam and I want to help. Please contact me at your earliest convenience so that we can meet to discuss your progress. Jaden has not responded to your invitation to meet and discuss her progress. From her responses in the Getting to Know You survey from an earlier class in the course, you took note that she's a first time freshman, has never taken an online course before, and Jaden is a single parent, single parent working full time. So we want you to compose your humanized feedback. We want you to take a look at this chart that we've provided and write feedback that includes high standards, effort, ability, and action. And um, once you've written your feedback, we wanna encourage you to share it on the Padlet below, keeping in mind that this is formative, okay? We know it's not gonna be polished work. This is a workshop, so we're workshopping these ideas. Um, I do see the, uh, the note up top, Let's look. we have a lot of people engaging in our doc, which is awesome. I've actually never seen that before. That's kind of exciting. Um, I'll take a look at that in a second and try to get it available to more folks. Just stay tuned. This is what the chart looks like. There's a continuum here and your goal is to write feedback that includes high standards, effort, ability, and specific action, okay, which is what the, you see some examples over on the right. So we're moving from fixed mindset, we're moving to including growth mindset in our feedback, and then including high standards, efforts, and ability to ultimately including all of those over on the far right side, okay, so you're aiming for the smiley face. So that's to support you. And then back on that other tab, if we click on go to the Padlet, that's where you'll, you'll see an opportunity to post your response um, here. So you can, you can put your name here if you want, or you can leave it anonymous, it's up to you. And then you'll post your, your um, humanized feedback down below. And that's that. So I'm gonna stop talking and we're gonna give you 15 minutes to work on this. So we'll go until about 11.48. Michelle, there's a question about Padlet in the chat. I'll take a look at those settings.
excuse my interruption. If you're having trouble with the Google Doc, try refreshing your browser page. page. I just published it and that might help. And I'm working on the Padlet problem. I'm a little stumped, to be honest. The Padlet should now be fixed, so you can refresh that page now too, and you should see the plus icon to make your post.
We have two more minutes in our work time. Okay, everyone, we're going to now wrap up our quiet work time. I'd like to thank everybody for participating in that and for your patience as I worked through a couple of little glitches. It's really exciting to see so many responses on the Padlet. Um, there's so much here. I did put in the chat and let everyone know that we have enabled commenting. So if you see something, you know, that really helps you see things in a different way, gives you an idea, something that you learn from, let that person know. That's a really nice gesture when, you know, when you see something you've contributed, contributed and know that it has inspired someone, let them know. Uh, you can leave a comment or you can just like it by clicking on the little heart down below. There's so much goodness here and it's very exciting. Um, I would like to open it up for comments and discussion now. So I would like to stop talking now and, and hear from some of you. I don't see any questions in the Q&A area, but I do want to invite you to click on the raise hand if there's just, if, if there's something you wanna share and it doesn't have to be a question. If there's a comment, if there's something you're taking away from the session, uh, ideas about how you want to use this in your class or share with your colleagues. This is just an open time to, to, to bring your voices in. So I'm going to be quiet and invite you to either raise your hand or type something into the Q&A if it's a question you'd like me to answer. So Anne, you are asking, how can I read the Padlet? So the Padlet to the link is at the bottom of the Google Doc with the instructions, but I'm gonna put the direct link to the Padlet again in the chat right now. I hope that is what you're looking for. Yeah, Eliana, you're asking if there are any studies with Latinx students and wise feedback. I think mm, there might be in the area of STEM, but I don't know off the top of my head. STEM is a really hot topic right now because A, we know that equity gaps are exacerbated in STEM, that's where they're highest. Um, and so the research has started with comparing black students and white students in those, those um, wise feedback studies, but um, Latinx students are, have been more focused on in recent years with the literature. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would consider myself more topically aware of the research than, you know, aware at that level. So you'd have to do a little bit of digging to find out.
You're welcome. Lots of love for Jaden here. <laughs> love it. And again, we want to invite you to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. It's always nice to hear other voices. I don't think I have any hands raised. Oh, there is a hand raised here. It is Gabriella. I'm going to give you permission to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Hi. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for the presentation as well. Um, my question is this. So I am a little concerned about unconscious bias because I've been doing this for so many years that I sometimes cannot even honestly judge if my words are really um being if I am just giving voice feedback or just playing paying a uh, big service to be hearing and not really being serious about it. So I was wondering if you can analyze some of the, I don't know if it's fair to do, but some of the posts that we have in the tablet and be really picky, maybe you don't mind, um, about the wording and what is it exactly that we're saying. And are we just telling the student, like, it is the student that had in the bag, yeah, yeah, go ahead, be better? Or are we really being challenging and being warm demanders? So Gabriella, I, I, I said I could hear you, but you're, I don't know if it's just me, but your audio is kind of going like this. And so I'm hearing parts of every word. I heard oh, something about unconscious bias. I heard something about choosing words. I heard something about warm demander, but I don't think I got your question clearly enough. Um. Is this, uh, can you hear me better now, or is it still doing the up and down? It's a little better, but it's still doing it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, I'll try to type it in. It's a long one, that's all right. Okay, yeah, it sounds like an, an important one. Um, yeah, unconscious bias, it's, it's unconscious. So, you know, I, again, I don't know what your question was exactly, but it's a continuous journey that we are on to understanding the, the blind spots that you know, as an individual, we can't see. And I think that what's really important is to lean in and have meaningful conversations with our peers. I know that many of my own biases have been revealed to me just in very vulnerable conversations with some of my colleagues. Um, and moving into those really uncomfortable spaces and having conversations, that's what we need to do more of. Uh, we need to do more of that. And our culture just doesn't, the more we identify with white dominant culture, it's like we, we put ourselves in these places where we don't wanna feel comfortable. It's hard, it's hard, but that's where we start to understand our own identity. And it's not until we understand our own identity that we can understand how to be inclusive of other identities. And um, Bill, Bill has a hand up. I'm going to give you the opportunity to speak now, Bill. Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed this uh, presentation. Uh, the problem that I've had, I've taught for a number of years, uh, and I'm approaching retirement. But in a lot of the research that I see um, and that I've looked at, they, they use these group terms. And I have a lot of trouble with that because when I look at my students and I get to know my students, most of them that when I have my uh, class evaluations and stuff, they love the fact that I am as open and uh, connected to them as they are. But Every time I hear somebody talking about Black students or Latinx students, and they use these group terms, I have this background um, experience 
that I've seen uh, Latinx students that were not prepared for college work and had some of the characteristics that um, are, uh, I, th I think are stereotypic characteristics that are described for those groups. But then I've had students that have elements of those and I've had students on the opposite side that have none of those characteristics. So, but, but they all get lumped into that same group when someone's talking about, well, how do you interact with, you know, with uh, Latinx students or black students or Filipino students, whatever the, whatever the uh, uh, category is. And I've approached in my teaching, I've tried to approach this more from a universal design uh, perspective uh, where I try to reach out to everybody and understand where each individual student is. And I've found that to be much more uh, informative for me or helpful for me in making adjustments or giving feedback as I get to know them as individuals uh, and not really um, say loading my expectations or thoughts about where they are culturally because they may not be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so we, I think what we're trying, well, I know what we're trying to do here is to move towards creating an inclusive environment for everyone. And what that requires us to understand is the different experiences that exist within, within a diverse group of students. Culture is different from race. They're not the same thing. Right. And that's, I think, maybe very important to say. So we could have, um, you know, someone who is Latina, who has been born and raised in the United States and has been influenced very heavily by white dominant culture and identify with a lot of those cultural values, you know, more so. And I think that that is what you're getting at. Um, I look at it more as knowledge that I want to have so that I can bring it into the conversations and the teaching of all of my students, less than looking at an individual student and saying, oh, this person has this identity and I need to speak to them this way. That's, 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 that's yeah, not what we want to do because we can't make judgments about a person based upon the way that they look. So I think that we want to think about it as being inclusive, be having, having teaching environments that welcome all different cultural backgrounds, allow students to bring their skill sets, their draw upon their existing knowledge, creating that environment that is responsive to our students. I think universal design for learning is amazing. I don't think that it is necessarily culturally like competent with regards to universal design for learning, it's very, it's very much in, in, indebted and informed by, by what we know about the way the human brain works, the different aspects of the way the human brain works. So um, I think that's a really fascinating conversation, Bill. Oh, that's and, true, that, yeah. that's true. But, but from my experience with this, like I see, like it, if you wanna, I, I understand the difference between race and culture as well, but, um, within a racial uh, element, if you just want to talk about there, I, I don't have a, um, I, I guess for me, it's hard for me to apply a black racial understanding when I have black students who strongly uh, adhere to a group identity, mm -hmm. but then I have black students that do not uh, adhere to that same identity, even though they're black. So when when I interact with them as they're doing whatever their performance is, it, it's so much easier, I think, for me as an instructor to accept them for who they are, and and really fully embrace this. Um, this concept of them as learners on a journey and meet them where they are 
And then depending on their obstacles or backgrounds that could be due to a variety of confounded variables like poverty, you know, you can be black and poor and gay at the same, and you have this intersectionality of issues that some people may have problems there and some people may not and be in that exact same intersectionality. So for me, it's like I, I found so much more uh, traction as not looking or not trying to classify people in like binary terms or categorical terms and then try to think about what they may need rather than meet them on this open, kind, loving platform and then seeing what their particular uh, impediments, whatever, challenges to their learning uh, uh, methodology is with them as individuals. Yes. So, so it I, has I, to be I, a dialogue. I, 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 has to be a dialogue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Bill. Yeah. Um, we are a few minutes over, but I am happy to stay. I know that everybody has different responsibilities. Um, I'm, I'm going to stick around a while. So you use this time as you as you need. Um, I'd like to honor some more. One hand that I see raised that has been raised for a while. Suzmita, are you able to stay for a couple minutes and ask your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, you know, thing is, uh, these are very, very important questions to raise and be mindful of. But uh, what I wanted to kind of convey also, if you have a huge classroom, mm. right? More than 60, 70 students, what are the best practices to reach students with individual needs? So in our last session, we spoke a little bit about large class sizes. And I first of all want to acknowledge that anytime we start fragmenting the amount of time that a teacher can spend with their students, then we are undermining inclusive teaching. We are undermining culturally responsive teaching. Um, and so I want to just say that that's a barrier. So anyone who's got, you know, the bigger your class is, the more of a barrier that is to you. Mm -hmm. So in the last session, what we considered was not that this is the only way to do it, but a strategy that we looked at was using the, um, getting to know you survey in week one and allotting time at the start of a course for building that trust and establishing the relationship before you get to the content. And if we make that a priority and carve out time in our first week for that, and one of the things students do is respond to this getting to know you survey. We had some questions in that survey, like in one word, how are you feeling about this class? What, are, what is one barrier that you think might interfere with your success in this class? And by scanning those results, which you should do in week one, look at all the results, identify the students who, who share barriers with you. Identify the students who use a word that, that, that is, has a more negative connotation than a positive connotation to describe how they're feeling about the class and consider them your high opportunity start students and target your human connection with those students at the start. Uh, we use the metaphor of a, a watering can. If you go out into your garden and you have a watering can, you've got all these plants, you know, you, you only have so much water, you're not going to water every plant. You're going to take a step back and try to figure out which ones need the water the most. And you're going to give the water to those students or that, those plants that week. Um, so that, that's a strategy, but it, it, it is hard. And I think things, um, there's, there's different ways that we design our assessments can help. And the wordings that we have in our, in our instructional materials can help. So there are lots of different ways beyond one-on-one -on -one interactions that we can create an environment where, where students feel like they can learn and grow and be successful. In, you know, in my classes, all the classes I teach, the first day is a kind of an introduction where students 
create their own Google Slides and they present certain things, I invite them to say uh, what are their, you know, uh, what they would like to share with others. So they do it in person. So I, each person, each student comes in and they present themselves. Like somebody loves making coffee, is an excellent baker or whatever it is, you know? So that kind of lays the foundation. Before the start of the class, I send them a survey because I need to know what kind of devices they have. Mm -hmm. Do they have an access to a printer? So since I teach a lab lecture class, those things are very, very important to me. Those are great strategies. I'm a, I'm a STEM teacher. Mm -hmm. So those things are very, very important to me because they have to go to a lab, they have to gather data, they have to create graphs, they have to understand uh, the implications and the results they have got. So getting to them, understanding where they are is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, Those are great strategies. But the other constraint is I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. I have two hours only in the class. I'm going to, I have to teach the course materials because they have to transfer, right? So that, that has to be robust. At the same time, I have to use these strategies. So I'm trying to work the best way as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was just looking for a couple of tips from you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds to me like you're already doing great things. Um, and, you know, you, you know what you're capable of. And I, you know, I'm also being mindful of Dr. May's IMAD's presentation last week about, mm -hmm. you know, trauma and all that, the emotions that we bring in from our own lives and what's happening in the world into our teaching and the trauma that we've been through as educators over the past couple of years with COVID. And mm -hmm. um, that, that is a play, that is at play here. And every single one of us just needs to be able to do what we are capable of doing and know that that is good enough right now and to not be too, too critical of ourselves and feel like we need to keep going more and more at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds to me like you have some great strategies and um, you may hear some overlap actually with our next session that we'll be focusing on with changing student learning narratives because we'll be talking about getting started with a self-affirming icebreaker. So thank you for your comments, Susan, Susan Ted. Thank you for being dedicated to our students. Thank you um, so much. I'm learning so much from you all. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to grant you the the ability to speak and uh, you will be the, the last question that we take today. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so when I was writing the feedback for Jaden, um, I was struggling with, I didn't wanna sound condescending or assuming anything. And so I, I'm not sure what to do with that. That's interesting. Um, so I think what I like to do in this activity is to think about creating a space for Jaden to feel comfortable to come to me. And I think that one of the really helpful strategies in doing that is to be personalized, right? So many people included it with, hello, Jaden. I saw the, you know, how are you today? Um, and acknowledging that, Tracy, right? Like, I don't know what's going on in your end, but here's what I see. And I want you to know that I'm available for you, right? So, I mean, share what you see. And I often say to my students, you know, teaching online is kind of like teaching in the dark because there's stuff that I can see, but there's so much that I can't. And so I'm reaching out to you to help you help me understand how to move forward and best support you. Um, and if that feels better to you to start the conversation that way, I also think that like breaking that ice of like um, the, the, in, the, in the prompt, there was the, the, the last message to all students was reach out to me and we'll find a time to talk, like trying to bridge that a little bit 
and understand that having students reach out is too much of a leap, right? For some students. Right. And so what can be helpful is to put structure just around that, maybe give two options, right? Um, I can give you a Zoom link that you can call into with your phone and we can talk through voice. You can click on it and we can talk through video. Um, does that work for you? You have, you know, being sure I've had students who don't want to meet in Zoom because they don't want to be on video because they think they have to be, right? So kind of demystifying that too. I don't know, does that help a little bit? But I'm, I, there's so many great examples that were just shared that I'm hoping if you glean through them, they may actually illuminate more ideas for you as well. But yeah, I, 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 I really appreciate what you just said. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, I did write my thing, but I think the thing, well, I don't think, I, the thing that I was was trying to avoid was pointing out that the, the grades weren't great. Where So I avoided that, but it sounds like it's okay to be like, hey, I noticed that you were struggling with this, like um, where it might not be academic, but it's more personal issues. Um, so it's cool to be like, okay, I've seen that your, your grades are 60% or something. Yeah. So if you're asking like about what, you know, that the, that Jaden works full time, right. And is a single parent. I mean, I would definitely bring that into the conversation because by letting students know that you remember what they shared with them, it, it's also a way of just letting them know that you see them. Right. Oh. I remember, I remember that you shared with me this from our survey at the start of the term, and that must be really difficult and I want to, I want you to understand that I want to work with you to help, you know, to help you through this struggling period, right? So yes, you should acknowledge those things. Absolutely. If a student has made the choice to share something with you, right, then, then by bringing it into a future conversation, it's a way of honoring that, right? Okay. But by not bringing it in, it's like, they're going to wonder if maybe you even read it. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Cause what I wrote sounds like I didn't even pay attention to what they had shared with me. It's like when I'm trying to avoid it, which is kind of the point of getting that survey. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Okay. I feel that. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Maria has asked, they did not reply to my messages. What should I do? That is such a hard one. I want to tell a quick story about a student um, in one of my classes um, who was a black male and didn't reply to my messages and was not, he was, he had completed a couple of assignments, but the way he completed them resulted in no credit because he hadn't been following the rubric. And I didn't know if it was a technology issue, what the gap was, but I was trying to really get to the heart of this and he wouldn't respond to my message. Wouldn't re and I just kept going and I kept going. And then I said, I kept saying in, in my messages, you can meet me in Zoom, we can set up a Zoom time. And then I led to, I will be in Zoom today from four to 4.30, click on this link if you're available and let's meet. And we finally, he finally did reply. And we finally did meet in Zoom, which was really difficult. He had a lot of challenges getting into Zoom, which was very eye-opening for me. And in that session, I was able to share my screen, show one of the assignments, and point out what he had done perfectly, and then point out the rubric at the bottom. And once I pointed to that rubric, he said, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was there. And that was the one thing that he needed. And after that, he was on point and I allowed him to go back and redo the assignments and he passed the class. So, you know, I think that me having like knowledge of just knowing that there are students on the other side of the screen that may not be replying because they're reluctant to do so, for whatever reason, keeps me pushing, particularly if I see like little cues that they are trying in the class, right? I mean, if there's no logging into the class, if there's no assignments being submitted, and I've tried multiple times, 
at a certain point, that's a student that is going to get less attention from me than other students that are showing those signs of engagements. But it's it's always after a pretty diligent effort. Yeah. Okay, everyone, we're gonna wrap up now. I need to go outside and get some air. <laughs> Thanks everyone for being here. This was amazing. Um, it's, it's really amazing to have so many people still here 15 minutes after we ended a 90 minute session. So take care. I will take a look at the chat and be sure that um, I've done my best to answer questions. I know there are some left and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here and giving your all to our session today.